The Money Show. Investment School. The Money Show brought to you by APSA CIB, winner of six accolades at the sixth annual South African Listed Tracker Awards. APSA is a registered FSP. Well, come to, for the first time, and I no doubt it won't be the last, uh, to the finance ghost. He doesn't have a name. Um, he is simply known as the finance ghost, or ghost, or ghosty. Um, ghosty? Ghost? Mr. Ghost? What does one call you? Hello, Bruce. I mean, we can go with Ghost. I think Ghost is fine. Ghost. It's not as easy okay. as your name, but we'll have to go with it. No, no. Well, Ghost. We'll call you Ghost. It's kind of weird. But hey, where, where did the name come from? What was the origin of it? What's the idea? Because you're a chartered accountant, as far as my sources will tell me, um, by profession. Yes, your sources are correct on that one. Uh, to be honest, I was actually doing some ghost writing for some wealth managers <sighs> kind of near the start of the pandemic. And I actually started this business borderline as a joke. And um, to be completely honest with you, I just thought, you know, why not have this really cool cartoon running around writing about the markets? It's a bit, it's a bit of fun. And it worked. Um, and that's really where the name came from. When I was doing all the ghost writing, I thought, well, the finance ghost feels like a cartoon I can turn into something fun. And yeah, literally the rest is history as the horrible cliche goes. That's incredibly creative for an accountant. I mean, you're more creative than Marcus Huster as an accountant. Hopefully in more useful ways as well, <laughs> I like to think. <laughs> um, so do you still run an accounting practice? Are you still, I mean, you're obviously still a CASA, you are an accountant, or has this mm. sort of become your full-time, your full-time gig? No, so I, I, it, number one, it is my full-time gig. Number two, I didn't even do articles in auditing. I did them in banking. So I ran away <sighs> from traditional accounting at the earliest opportunity possible. So I'm a bit of an accidental <laughs> accountant, uh, as you can probably guess based on what I do for a living now. Actually, um, okay. Bruce, you'll, you'll, quite, you'll, you'll quite enjoy this. I, I actually distinctly recall in my investment banking days, I was doing a lot of flying between uh, Joburg and Cape Town. And I actually saw you at the Cape Town <gasps> airport sitting at the Mug and Bean, I think it was. And jokes aside, I walked past and I thought, you know, one day when I'm big, I'm going to get to do some podcasting oh. and, and that kind of stuff for a living. So thank you, because uh, I distinctly remember that day, actually. And I thought, you know, that that seems like a, a more fun life than what I was currently doing. And I think that's true. It is more fun. It is. No, no, it's, it's, it, don't tell anybody. But it's not really work. Um, now, but you do do real work and you do do uh, company analysis and you do analysis of, of, of shares, not only online, not only in podcasts, uh, but you're writing a lot for the financial mail and you're increasingly being taken incredibly seriously by a bunch of very serious people in terms terms of your ability to analyze companies and tonight what we've asked you to do is help us to to do what you do um, and that mm. is um, is to how to research stocks and um, before we do that though I did ask a little earlier which has been the best performing company on the JSE over the last 20 years it's delivered a return uh, according to Fin Me Up on Twitter today of 75,169 percent that company would be oh, I'm going to guess Capitec how many? How much? Uh, how much investment outside of South Africa has Capitec made? In in around numbers, uh, around uh, z- zero. Zero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is so interesting, isn't it? I mean, I look at the top five performing stocks over the last thirty years, the uh, last twenty years, according to Fin Me Up. And here's the here's the craziest thing: um, the best performer is Capitec with seventy five thousand percent return. Naspers at 27,000, courtesy of an investment in a little tech company called Tencent. Number three is Clicks at 4,500%, ShopRite at nearly 4,000%, and Mr. Price at just over 3,000%. Now, out of those five, Capitec, Clicks, ShopRite, and Mr. Price, the vast majority of their growth and opportunity has been where? In South Africa. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, they ignoring gone, us, Bass, yeah. Yeah, ignoring us, Bass. But I mean, if, if you'd invested in, in if, you, if you'd taken a bet against South Africa um, 20 years ago in terms of investment returns, you would have missed out on four of the top five performing sto- uh, t- uh, t- stocks. And that's kind of a, a weird contradiction in terms of where our, our, our minds are in terms of the state of the nation, the state of the stock market it's in South Africa at the moment. Look, there's some big selection bias in that because it's the top performing JSE stock. So you would kind of yeah. expect them to be big in South Africa. It would be interesting to compare them to some global opportunities. But yes, no, no, on the whole, no. I think management teams do well where they focus and where they understand. 
It's a long list of companies who have tried to invest elsewhere in the world and just gotten it horribly wrong. And uh, there's been this very interesting kind of homecoming in the past few years. I don't know if you've noticed on the JSC, oh, yeah. a lot of management teams very much now focusing on South Africa. ShopRite's a great example. I mean, they since they kind of stopped you know, trying to become this African giant, they are doing much, much better. And it comes through in their numbers. Uh, absolutely. I'm going, to, I'm going to test Whitey Busson's thinking on that because I'm chatting to him at the Franchuk Literary Festival uh, in May, middle of May or thereabouts. Um, and I wonder what he thinks about his successor strategy and, and how uh, Frankie's going to be about the fact that it, much of what he did has been undone um, and it's doing better now as a result. But anyway, we'll, we'll have that discussion. I'll be sitting more than an arm's length away from him, so he won't be able to punch me. Now, how do we assess stocks? <laughs> because if, if 20 years ago, and, and the, the, the prevailing sense was South Africa is in trouble, don't waste your time putting money in South African shares, so take your money offshore. And a lot of people did and have done incredibly well because they've got a currency benefit and all sorts of things. But it's kind of counterintuitive to see these five stocks doing so well over the last 20 years. I wonder how you go about the process of researching stocks. So researching companies with a, with a, with a view of investing in them. So I'll make one point before I answer the investing mm. point, And that is, it's, I think it's fantastically important for anyone to actually put a little bit of effort into understanding what's going on in the landscape around them from a company perspective. Even if you're just an employee and you have no interest and invest in your own money because just think about how many people are caught completely unawares by big restructuring programs, completely blindsided by these big retrenchments. What's happening in my industry? How is this happening to me? They also lose the opportunity to track industries that are doing well and potentially making better career moves as a result. And the other group of people who I think should pay a lot of attention to listed companies is small business owners. Learn from what the big guys are doing. Why not? Go and understand what they are doing with their balance sheets. Go and understand how they think about segments, how they think about margins. So it's not just about investing. And I think with that hat, that brings me to my first point really, which is sure. it's actually not just about the numbers. So there's this kind of very bad reputation where people think investing is literally just this incredible number crunching exercise and you need to understand all 150,000 pages of the annual report, otherwise you stand no chance. I can assure you that a huge amount of investing is actually common sense, which as the old joke goes, is not that common, otherwise we wouldn't see such crazy moves on the market. Correct. Common sense plays a huge factor here and just understanding business strategy so if I may, Bruce, Clicks is a great example, right? Why has Clicks done so well over the years is because grocery stores really sucked at doing health and beauty. <laughs> That's the reality. They allowed yeah. Clicks to become really big in that space. And then Clicks introduced pharmacies to actually keep people coming into the stores. People forget that this game was always a pharmacy first and then a front shop. Clicks was always a front shop and then they brought in the pharmacies. So just look around you, especially when you're investing in retail. I don't know about you, but I see Checkers 6060 scooters absolutely everywhere. I don't see many pick and pay ASAP ones. And I think I've seen one of those spa vehicles. Now, again, you're not going to find that in the annual report. You're going to find that on the roads around you. So the first point when you're investing is just open your eyes and have common sense to what's going on around you in your peer group. What are people doing with their money? Where's that money going? Um, I, I remember the, one of the first investment stories I ever wrote a long time ago. I was chatting to an asset manager and um, he gave me a list of five stocks that he liked. And it was one of them was Spur. And I said, why Spur? He said, because my kids like to go there. And when I go there, I see Chico the Clown at the time. And I see this and I see that. And I see lots of other families. And I just see lots of people spending an awful lot of money on hamburgers. Um, and he said, you know, and then he got, he got to understand the business model and he got to understand the way in which it worked. And he absolutely he decided that you know if his kids loved it for as long as they liked it he'd stay invested in spur and it was it's, it's that sort of weird sort of you know obviously he'd done the fundamental analysis too but the first port of call was the fact that his kids liked it and he was therefore dragged there um and um actually it turned into an investment opportunity so there's a lot of you know good common sense in that and you've made the point there as well around the fundamental analysis and that is absolutely critical we cannot forget that part of the journey. So yes, Clicks has done insanely well. Clicks also trades on a massive multiple now. And Clicks 20 years ago had this incredible growth runway ahead of it. You now have to ask yourself, well, what does the Clicks growth runway look like now? You but, know, but does you it deserve didn't, to trade on this it multiple? It wasn't 
it wasn't obvious 20 years ago. And here's the thing, because, no. again, um, if you looked at clicks back then, and I, oh, David Neal, I, I, I'm terrified that I might bump into him one day because I suspect he may remember me once saying that I don't like clicks because it feels like a general dealer's. Um, and he got very cross with me for, for <laughs> saying clicks as a general dealer's because I was selling kettles and I couldn't figure out what it was. Health and beauty and kettles and toasters and sandwich makers and, oh, for goodness sake, what is this thing? Um, but it, it's the formula proved to be incredibly successful. David Neal came from Boots in the United Kingdom and and really focused um, clicks a lot more on that health and beauty segment. They still sell the toasters and stuff, but it's less of an emphasis as far as I can tell now anyway. So the thing with clicks, which is actually a great lesson in retail, is they've basically handpicked the best retail categories and they've built a business around it. So they don't try and sell you a fresh lettuce that they make, you know, 17% on if they're lucky. They sell you a brand new kettle and fancy shampoo. Actually, the worst part of the business is the pharmacy because pharmacy margins are much lower than what they make in the front shop. There's a reason why they have that queue now where you take a ticket to let you walk around the store until your name is called. It's genius. It's very annoying in terms of it takes longer, especially in the beginning but it's very very clever because then you go and browse the shelves and that's where the margin sits so you know in retail people don't realize the difference in margin between the really low margin stuff and the really juicy stuff and health and beauty is the best category of the lot because everyone needs shampoo well almost everyone i luckily still have my <laughs> hair and i need shampoo and it the margins on it are fantastic you know on food yes everyone needs food but in a lot of cases the margins are not great and that is where a lot of the grocery stores sometimes, you know, get it wrong. That's why you'll randomly see a TV on the shelf at a big enough pick and pay. You know, I always think who buys their TV at a pick and pay, but clearly people do. And when they do, pick and pay probably puts 40% gross margin in the toll. Thank you very much. And I wonder how many people truly do pay attention to the world around them. I think many of us are oblivious about the world and the way it works uh, and why it is that that TV is on the shelf. And it is there for the profit margin. It, you know, you'll probably get a good deal on it. And you'll probably be very pleased with the TV that you bought. You'll fit it into the trolley and in the back of your car. Um, and, and that's fine. You've got yourself a new TV. Sweet. Very nice. But um, we, we don't pay nearly enough attention and challenge the way the world works, something as small as the ticket at the clicks to allow you to go and scout the, the aisles while, because it's, you know, standing in the queue is a boring process, um, is just is that, that stroke of genius which makes them then uh, get a commercial advantage over rivals. Yeah, basically. And I mean, look at what ShopRite is doing in experimenting with new store formats. So all you have to do is walk around the mall. So Canal Walk's a good example. I live in Cape Town and that's a good spot to go and see, you know, what's up and coming in retail because most of them are in Canal Walk. ShopRite is playing all kinds of interesting games. And the latest one is this clothing business, Unique, which, you know, the logo is not very unique as people have pointed out on Twitter, <laughs> yes. but that's fine. Um, the business looks interesting. And I was actually walking past one the other day. It looks quite upmarket, actually. So it's not obvious that they are going directly after pick and pay clothing with that thing. It almost feels it, like they're going a little more upmarket than that. Higher. But it's interesting. Yeah. No, exactly. They do. It does feel. It's, it feels sharper. It feels trendier. It feels edgier. It feels like they're going after Mr. Price. It feels like they're going after further, further up the value chain. Um, and there's no reason why they shouldn't, because the margins in clothing, as we know, particularly locally manufactured clothing, um, are are substantial. We pay big bucks for clothes in South Africa, and we don't get too many discounts on them either. Yeah, and people forget about the supply chain, right? So it's easier for Shoprite to go and open a clothing store than it is for Truers to go and open a grocery store because they have no cold chain whatsoever. So once you've got mm -hmm. cold chain sorted out, then you can be a grocery store. After that, you can be anything you want. And that's where I look at what a business like ShopRite is doing. And what I'm excited about is this homecoming story where people are no longer thinking, okay, the best thing to do with my capital and time is to go and buy a retailer in some exotic land. Let me rather identify a market segment in South Africa and actually go after it. And I think the last kind of offshore deal we've seen was probably Pepco's uh, deal in South America. And we'll see how that plays out. I mean, Woolworths has finally just cut David Jones loose. That's in its dying stages now, that deal. Thank goodness. They can focus mm -hmm. on their home environment and look at what Roy Bagatini is achieving there, how much better the clothing side of Woolworths looks. So 
I mean, I've, we seem to be talking a lot about retail tonight, but you know, you it's spend, very much about understanding you spend your far home too market. Much, you spend far much, too much time at the shops, I think is the problem here, Mr. Ghost. It, ironically, no. I spend so little time at the shops. If anything, I'm the world's biggest fan of something like Checkers 6060. It's fantastic. I try okay. to minimize my time at the shops as much as I can. But when you do go, you're paying attention. You're paying attention to different things than the mm. window displays, although I'm sure the window displays do, do register. You mentioned earlier something important, and that is, you know, 20 years ago, clicks what runway was there. Well, in retrospect, there was an enormous runway, but it took careful strategic decision making by David Neal, as, as, as who was then appointed uh, CEO of Clicks, um, to put the pharmacies in the back. Despite the fact that the margins were low, what he was doing was ensuring people were coming in through the front door, through the sweet smelling um, fragrance counters and the shampoo and all the, the other stuff, and then finding themselves in the shop and then doing the, the more spontaneous purchases, perhaps. And and that then you said, what sort of runway does it have into the future? How does one then begin to look at these companies uh, and say, okay, fine, Capitec gave 75,000%. It's certainly not going to do that in the next 20 years, but it may do, you know, five times, 10 times that. I don't uh, uh, 10 times returns over the next 20 years. They've got a smart management team, a smart systems. They're very dominant in, 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 in retail banking. Uh, how does one assess what the future of a company looks like? Yeah, so this is where a feel for the valuation becomes really important, right? And what often happens is a big growth story ends up attracting this incredible valuation because people assume that growth is going to carry on into perpetuity, and it's not. It cannot. It simply cannot. So Capitec is a great example. They've taken so much market share from the other banks, and deservedly so. You know, The other banks were absolutely sleeping on the job. Capitec came in with a singular focus, and they did exceptionally well. Great. However, I don't care which brand you are in the world, there is a practical limit to how much market share you can realistically win. You will be very hard pressed to find a single capitalist sector anywhere in the world where there is you know, only one player in that market. It requires a huge moat. Even stuff like telecoms, there's still always a few that at least give it a go. So you've got to say to yourself, how does Capitec grow from here? Can they keep winning market share? Yes, yeah, sure they can. At the rate that they used to? No, almost no. certainly not. Where else are they going to grow, right? Because they are, like all the other big banks, they are beholden now to the fortunes of the South African economy, like all the banks are. And yet Capitec has this outlier valuation, completely different to all the others. And if you have a look over the last year, I haven't looked at this chart in a while, but the last time I did, which was a few weeks ago, Capitec was the underperformer in the segments over the past year because the growth has been priced in. And you'll often hear that term if you read a lot of financial writing or if you follow people on Twitter. And all that means is it's a, it's a full valuation is another way of saying it. Is the valuation multiple is high relative to what the growth is likely to be. And that's a very dangerous situation. That's where you stand every chance of a share price that goes gently sideways for a very long time, paying you dividends and away it goes. And sometimes in a low interest rate market, for example, people are happy to pay that because you know if you can't get much of a yield in interest, but you can get a really dependable dividend and a share price that at least goes up with inflation. You know, pension funds like that, big institutional investors like that. But when you start getting into a big interest rate environment like this, where actually you can get strong yield on stuff like government bonds, equity prices come under pressure when they're at big multiples because they're not returning enough for the yeah. risk. And I think Clix is in much the same boat, actually. So Clix, Capitec, those are good examples of that kind of story. Um, I look at something like ShopRite, that's certainly not on a cheap multiple, but they've proven an ability to grow and to keep winning market share. And they are going after a huge prize. The grocery market is a massive, massive market. And of course, it's not just grocery when it comes to ShopRite. They are expanding into other categories. They could well, in, in 10 years' time, I would not be shocked if ShopRite was one of, I don't know, the four biggest clothing retailers in South Africa. Why not? Yeah. Why can't yeah, they be? There's no uh, obvious uh, reason. Uh, and I see them in banking, and I see them in all kinds of other industries too, into the future as well. Should they choose to go there, of course. I mean, there's there's no um, that they've got customers coming through the door all the time. They do cash transactions. They do transactions across borders. They do all sorts of things all the time. Yeah, absolutely, they do. And so there's no reason to bet against that happening. You know, whereas Clicks is a one-trick pony. It's a great business, but it's a, literally a one-trick pony. They have one type of store. You may recall they had Musica back in the day. That's gone. And now it's clicks, and it's just clicks. Mm. So you have to look at this and say, well, do I want to pay? I haven't looked in a while either, but a higher PE multiple usually for clicks than for ShopRite. Which one's going to grow more over the next 10 years? I can tell you my money would be on ShopRite every time.
Mm. One of the most, okay, so we need to pay attention to our environment. We need to look at different operating models. We need to see how we feel when we go into these shops. Are they doing things differently? Are they ensuring that their customers are spending more money with them than uh, we see uh, customers spending with rivals? That's useful. Then we've got to really appreciate the valuations, making sure we're not paying too much money for a share. And the easiest way of doing that, perhaps, is saying, am I paying 10 times last year's profits or 20 times last year's profits or 30 times last year's profits, each time getting more and more expensive? And what are its prospects for the future? And we assess its prospects for the future very briefly, if we can, by looking out for a few important things. What are those few important things in two minutes or less? Okay, so you're definitely uh, just looking for how much of a moat the business have has, which is really how defensive it is against new competitors coming in. You know, how disruptable is this business, if that's even a word? So that's something to definitely look for. And I think in this environment, you have to look at the balance sheet because interest rates are climbing. I mean, this last hike was big. And what I'm seeing more and more at the moment is businesses that are literally just treading water. They are just going sideways or slightly better. So what's happening is they are managing to grow their profits in the underlying operations, maybe like 6 or 7 or 8%. But because of what's happened to their debt, the bankers are getting that, not the equity holders. So what you're looking for in this environment, I think, is a business that doesn't have too much debt, has, business, has markets that it can grow into. Ideally, they've proven an ability to do that already because if someone's already done something, it's easier to assume they can keep doing it rather than betting on a management team suddenly waking up tomorrow and being able to enter a new market. You know, that's the clicks example again. It would be a big punt to say these guys can do something completely different to what they've always been doing. And I think just the way the business creates cash, that's so key. You know, so when you're looking at the financials, always look for a metric called cash from operations. Go and find it. Learn what this thing tells you. It tells you how the profits turn into cash because if all the profits just get sucked up into inventory or into people owing you money or into you having to pay your creditors faster for whatever reason, the shareholders are actually not getting anything. And at the end of the day, the cash is absolutely everything. It's something that US tech companies are intensely good at actually hiding in all kinds of innovative (laughs) ways. Locally, we don't have anywhere near that much nonsense. We really don't. So go look at these sort of metrics and understand how much of the money is actually coming your way versus how much is going to the bankers, how much is going into the supply chain, how much is going into the inventory in the warehouse. It's complicated. I mean, if this was simple, everyone would be fabulously wealthy and would all make money on the market, obviously. But it's also a really cool learning journey. And the more you read... That's the biggest advice I can give. Just read every single thing you possibly can and read stuff that you don't agree with because an echo chamber does you no favors. You've got to read stuff that challenges you on a company you love. Go and read something by someone who thinks it's rubbish and go and ask yourself if they have a good point that maybe you've missed and vice versa. What fabulous insights. Ghost. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening. Finance Ghost, you'll find him on social media platforms. You'll find him in the Financial Mail. And um, he certainly is a very influential voice in the world of money and investing in South Africa.